Well, good morning, brothers and sisters, all of you guys out there on Facebook watching us live, and for you brothers and sisters on the Bethany Men's Prayer Line. Now, I know it says Men's Prayer Line. That's not saying that you sisters aren't welcome either, but good morning to you all, and I, a happy Monday to every one of you. I hope that your weekend was blessed. Mine was. Uh, I was just sharing with the brothers there. Uh, on the line that my weekend seemed a bit longer than usual, but we know that 24-hour period passes the same. It's just that our activity could be different, and I'm glad to be here. For those of you watching live on Facebook, I would encourage you that if you have any prayer requests, please share them in the comment section. Um, for those of you here on the prayer line, uh, let us know at the end. Indicate at the end of the presentation um, by hitting your star six on your phone to unmute your phone, uh, you can let us know if you have any prayer requests at that time. Without further ado, I would like to begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, I am thankful this morning that you are here with us, that you have been with us, that you have blessed us, that you have protected us as we slept. We are glad this morning to be alive we are glad to be clothed in our right minds, Father. We are, we are blessed. And sometimes we fail to realize just how blessed we are. Lord, you are the one that provides the food. You are the one that provides the clothing, the homes that we sleep in, the vehicles that we drive, the jobs that we clock into each day. This is all a part of your, of your providence, of your blessings on our behalf. Help us to return unto you a faithful life. And this is our prayer. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, our topic is Steps to Christ, Volume 3. Realizing our condition. Now, for those of you that are watching on Facebook Live, I'm going to share with you a picture, if I can find it. Here it is, of the book that we have been studying out of these last two weeks, uh, including today. And this book is entitled Steps to Christ. Now, this is the Steps to Christ study guide. For those of you on the prayer line and on Facebook, if you're interested in getting a copy of this book and would like to know how, please let me know. Let Brother Kenworth Fitzgerald, who is the administrator of this group, or his assistant, our dear brother Ashley, let them know as well at the end of this prayer line. Um, and we can find out a way to get a copy of this book to you. Amen. This book was written by a dear sister by the name of Ellen G. White. Who was Ellen G. White? Ellen G. White was an inspired woman who wrote only what God had already stated in his word. She amplifies the Bible and leads men and women into soul searching through her straight testimony. She died in 1915, but left behind hundreds of publications and books that are inspired by God. Steps to Christ, Volume 3, Realizing Our Condition. It is only through Christ that we can be brought into harmony with God. But how are we to come to Christ? I will answer this question with another. If someone were to steal your car and later on felt bad about it, what would be expected? Would you be satisfied with just a letter detailing how sorry he or she was for stealing your vehicle? No, you would expect that if he were sorry for what he or she did, that they would return the car. This would be the only acceptable form of repentance. Unfortunately, however, our approach to God is hardly any different. We can say the most beautiful words when attempting to acknowledge our wrong. But do we care to deal with the heart of the matter. The thief stole a car. So true repentance would involve returning that car. Amen. For the sinner, the issue 
is the heart. We must do more than repeat to God what it was that we have done. We must beg God to change the heart. The sinful heart must be presented to the Lord and it must be done in a sincere manner. But in order to do this, the sinner must be acquainted with his or her condition. John chapter 12 verses 46 reads, I am come a light unto the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. The darkness that Christ is referring to here in John 12, 46 is not the type of darkness that occurs at night after the setting of the sun. This darkness is a state of confusion. It is the unknown. It is not apprehending due to difficulties that block our path. Do we truly realize our condition? One major reason we do not pray as we should is because our view of our true condition is obscured. And this brings me to the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector in the book of Luke, starting in chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. And the story goes that a Pharisee goes into the temple to pray. And when he gets there, he notices a publican, a tax collector praying as well. And what does he record in that prayer? Like I said, you can read it for yourself in the book of Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. That Pharisee, that individual who is righteous in his own mind, and, and might I add, at the beginning of this story, when you begin to read it, Christ responds, or he is making this this, he's sharing this parable in response to those in the crowd who are listening that feel themselves to be self-righteous. And as this Pharisee enters the temple and begins to pray, he starts praying and saying, I am so glad that I'm okay. I'm so glad that I'm better than others. In fact, I'm even better than this Pharisee, than this publican over here, this tax collector. I mean, this is how he's praying and he's praying out loud so that everybody can hear him. He's basically not coming in a humble manner. He's coming giving evidence of how good he is, which in truth is really only evidence of how sinful and unworthy he is. But then in contrast to this Pharisee, you have the tax collector who the Pharisee was talking about. And in his prayer, he does not even lift up his face into the heavens. He is so humbled by the fact that he is a sinner, that he is praying saying, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. He's beating on his chest. He is, he is agonizing with the Lord because he realizes his, his true condition, or rather, he realizes his true condition. How do we pray? We must know our true condition. It is important. And if we, like the Pharisee, go into the presence of God praying as if we're one who is worthy, as if we're one who has no sin, and if we pray a comparing ourselves amongst ourselves, we might just think that we're better or that we're good because, yeah, we may have more or better outward effects of righteousness than, say, our brother or our sister. But even so, God is the only one that searches the heart. Who are we to go into the presence of God and to think that we are better than someone else? This is how the Pharisee prayed. But that publican, that tax collector understood himself. He understood that he was a sinner and he prayed in that manner. Ellen White says the following in the book Steps to Christ. When the heart yields to the influence of the spirit of God, the conscience will be quickened and the sinner will discern something of the depth and the sacredness of God's holy law. The foundation of his government in heaven and earth. The light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world illumines the secret chambers of the soul, and the hidden things of darkness are made manifest. Conviction takes hold upon the mind and heart. The sinner has a sense of the righteousness of Jehovah and feels the terror of appearing in his own guilt 
and uncleanness before the searcher of hearts. When we begin to realize our own condition, it's the equivalent of turning on a light in a dark room. It's like turning the key and starting the engine. Because once we see self correctly, we can begin to approach the issue at its core. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And when I look at that, the heart, meaning the mind, not the, the beating artifice that is in our chest that pumps blood. The heart here is referring to our conscience, our mind. The mind is fraudulent, deceptive, and misleading above all things. It is sick. Who can comprehend it? You know, I remember back in the year 2005, I was working for the Review and Herald. For those of you who are not familiar with the Review and Herald, they are a publishing company that is connected to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They, they, they make books, religious books. They make cookbooks. They make children's books. And they produce these books and they distribute them out in the community. They sell them. And my job at this time was to uh, recruit students on college campuses to work throughout the summer to sell these books with me. And I remember during the summer of 2005, while working for the Review and Herald, I was courting a, a sister. And, and I'm just sharing with you the deceitfulness of the heart. I was courting a particular sister, and I had gotten friendly with four fellas or three fellas on campus at the college where I was recruiting. And we had started going to the club together. We had started drinking together, hanging out, smoking together. Although I was working for a religious company, although I was doing work uh, that was spiritually uh, inclined, I myself was not a spiritual person. And at this time, I was doing all these type things with these young men that were younger than I, and we were doing foolishness. I mean, every weekend at the club and renting uh, hotel rooms and, and having parties and different things of this nature. And I remember the young lady that I was talking to, she was an adult. She was not a college student. She came and she was recruited and she began working with me. And she had a little trailer that she lived in and she would never keep this place locked. And I knew where she kept her purse. I knew where she kept her money. And one evening, because I didn't have money, I went into her trailer when she was not there and I stole her credit card. True story. And I went around, started using this woman's credit card. Not only did I do that, I didn't stop there. I remember going into the dorm, hanging out with these three fellas that we were tight with, that I was tight with at the time. And one of them had a roommate and I'm going through this individual's drawers. And I'm just being completely honest, man. I was going through his drawer, his dresser drawer in the, in, in the, uh, in the dorm. And I found a credit card. And I took that credit card and I started shopping with it. I started taking folk out to eat and charging it to this credit card. I remember we were on our way from Keene, Texas to um, Worcester, Massachusetts, about a 1,500 mile drive. And on the way up there, I'm purchasing food with this credit card. And the individual whose card I took actually was recruited with us and he's following us and with us on this trip. And I remember I get to Taco Bell where we stopped at a rest area and I'm trying to grab something to eat. I swipe the card and it's declined. And you know, brothers and sisters, I, although I was dumb, I wasn't stupid. I knew that when that credit card swiped and it was declined, that the jig was up. I had been caught. I went into that bathroom. I ripped up that credit card and I tried flushing it down the toilet. Would you believe that the individual whose credit card I stole, he and his mother were watching me the whole time and knew that I had his credit card. The sister who I was courting, whose credit card I had stolen, her sister who had the, the joint account that I had, you know, uh, uh, broken into, begged her sister to go to the police and press charges. And in fact, she did. And upon walking out of that, uh, that, that, that uh, police station that day, she was convicted to go back inside and drop the charges. And her sister was furious. 
brothers and sisters, I might still be in jail this day if she had filed those charges. If the other individual who I had, whose credit card I had stolen had filed charges, the heart is deceitful and wicked. It is sick. It is deceptive and misleading. That is what we just learned in the book of Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. And we cannot rightly understand ourselves. Remember, we are trying to ascertain our true condition. We are trying to realize our true condition. And I was truly sick. Now, brothers and sisters, we are born in sin and shaping in iniquity. This is what we're told in God's word. And it is only by coming to God and having an experience with him, having an encounter, that we are changed from carnal mindset into a spiritual one. We are still carrying the nature of sin, and this is why we're tempted to do wrong, because the temptation comes and it appeals to our nature. It is within our nature to do wrong. We must realize and accept this idea, accept this reality, and as we accept it, we can move on. Continuing in my reading, so where does the sinner turn? How can changes be made? Sister Ellen White in the book Steps to Christ says the following. Christ must be revealed to the sinner as the Savior's... Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Christ must be revealed to the sinner as the Savior dying for the sins of the world. And as we behold the Lamb of God upon the cross of Calvary... The mystery of redemption begins to unfold to our minds and the goodness of God leads us to repentance. In dying for sinners, Christ manifested a love that is incomprehensible. And as the sinner beholds this love, it softens the heart, impresses the mind, and inspires contrition in the soul. Brothers and sisters, Realizing our condition involves us coming to the realization that we are sinful. How do we come to this realization? It, we come through it through knowledge, yes. But when we perceive, when we look back on our lives, when we look at our lifestyle, when we look at our thoughts, when we conceive or perceive that those things which we have loved, the things that we have pursued, then it is readily available to us the fact that we are truly in a wretched condition. When we begin to open the word of God and we begin to see what true righteousness is, when we look at Christ and we look at his sinless life, when we look at how forgiving he was, when we look, how, uh, look at how much mercy he has, when we look at the fact that he is full of grace, when we perceive that everything with him was the opposite of selfishness, then we begin to have a glimpse of what it is that we truly are. We must come to the realization of self because in reality, we are not fighting against the devil. Now, yes, he is warring against us. But our greatest enemy is self because Satan comes and tempts us through the avenue of our own selfish desires. These desires are in, in, in within. They are deeply rooted within us. We must come to the realization, my dear friends, that we are sinners. And like the publican in the sanctuary, when we are praying, we must pray in a spirit of humbleness. We must pray knowing who and what we are. We must pray understanding that we are sinners and that we cannot fix ourselves. Not like the Pharisee who was comparing himself to other sinners and saying, well, look how good I am. Yes, compared to other sinners, you might just be great. Compared to other sinners, you might just be good. When I think about athletic uh, uh, institutions like the NFL or the NBA, you, these are all professional basketball and football players, but yet there are some that are elevated in their skills more than others. I mean, yeah, we may, we, we may pat them on the back. We may give them more accolades because they may have a bit better skill than the other individual who's throwing the football or shooting the hoops. But in reality, they're all superstars within the realm of this sports entertainment. How can you compare yourself to another? How can we compare ourselves to other sinners? We must look at Christ. We must look at Jesus and upon understanding and having a realization of who and what he is, 
then we will truly begin to understand who and what we are. Realizing our true condition begins with a humble heart. It begins with understanding and realizing that, you know what? I have nothing to offer God in the form of righteousness. All I can do is bring my heart in its sinful condition exactly like it is and allow him to do a work upon me. The individual going to the hospital does not try to fix themselves before they go. If you get your arm cut open and blood is spewing out, yes, you can put bandages or put something on it to try and hemorrhage the bleeding. But you run to the hospital. You don't wait. In that same condition, and in that same condition, when, we, when you realize that something's wrong physically, you go to the hospital. When you realize that something is wrong with you spiritually, when we come to the realization of self, when we look in the mirror and we realize that you're, our greatest enemy is the person staring back at us, then we're going to run to figure out the problem. And Christ is the hospital. His word is the medication bomb. It gives us the ability not only just to see the problem, but it also fixes it. Brothers and sisters, let us realize our true condition this morning. And as a result of, 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 of ascertaining our true condition, let us fall on our knees in humble spirits like the publican and pray to be changed. Father God in heaven, we thank you this morning for your love, for your grace, and for your mercy. We thank you for opening our eyes, Lord, so that we can see clearly who we are in comparison to you. We're not worried about comparing ourselves to brother and sister so-and-so, to our neighbors, to our co-workers. We're not comparing ourselves to the individual sacking groceries at the local grocery store. I'm not comparing myself to any other minister. I'm comparing myself to Christ. And we must see ourselves as Christ sees us. We must see Christ and then look at our own lives and ask the question, am I like him? When we fathom and realize the truth of the matter, it will cause us to fall on our knees like the publican and cry out saying, Lord, I am a great sinner. And it will cause us to have our hearts drawn closer to you. We thank you for giving us the evidence of our true condition. For if we don't realize our true condition, we cannot receive help. We thank you and we praise you this morning and we lift up your mighty name and we do this in Jesus name. Amen. To all of you out there on Facebook, have a blessed day. This is Andre Battles with I Battle Daily Ministries. Be blessed.